I'm really pleased to be able to join um, two of my favorite colleagues here at Teachers College, Carol Garber and Steve Silverman, in the, this session. Uh, and I'm equally pleased to join two of our alumna, um, Aaron and Deborah. And Aaron, I think this is the first time I've met you. Um, and I'm delighted to do that. And I reacquainted with Deborah at a recent alumni event in Boston uh, in cold January. Uh, so it's great to have you here on a little bit warmer day. So as you know, we're going to talk a little bit about the pathways to wellness. And um, I think we've got a very good panel to do that. You've already heard the introductions. Uh, you've heard the cultural authority that they will bring to the session today. Um, what we're going to do is uh, each one of our panelists will speak for about five to seven minutes in serial order, starting with Professor Garber. And then we're going to um, have a little bit of a discussion among ourselves and ask you to join us in that discussion. So, Professor Garber, without further ado, would you like to, with those very cool glasses, uh, begin the session? Uh, thank you, John, and I apologize for wearing the sunglasses. It's not because I'm a rock star. I have a little problem with my eyes, so the lights bother them. Uh, but I'm so pleased to be here, and, and I wanted to spend my time just talking a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing in our applied physiology laboratory, uh, because it is applied to the whole population, and our work is to try to prevent chronic diseases through exercise and physical activity, and also to work with people who have chronic diseases to help them uh, do better and deal with their chronic disease more effectively. Uh, and I think the, the most important thing that we've been working on in recent times has been um, my work on uh, developing exercise guidelines for adults through the American College of Sports Medicine. And these guidelines have just uh, come out uh, just over a year ago and have really updated um, our recommendations for adults uh, for exercise. And I think one thing that's really clear is being active uh, and exercising regularly is vital for your health and my health. Um, and we all should engage in it. Um, what's also clear is that most of us really have a very hard time of continuing to be physically active if we've ever started or even getting started um, in the first place. Uh, the good news is that you don't have to do too much exercise in order to be healthy. And the recommendations are to exercise at least moderately on five or more days per week. Um, or to do more vigorous exercise, you can only uh, get away with uh, three days a week. Um, but the other thing that's quite important is that there are other kinds of exercise that also can really make an impact on your health. So those include things like resistance training and stretching um, and those popular activities like yoga and Pilates and Tai Chi. So, if you look at our recommendations, you'd say, well, I, I think I'm going to have to do about 300 minutes of exercise every day, um, which most of us can't even get 30 minutes. So uh, I'll assure you, you don't need to do quite that much, although that certainly would be the optimal. Uh, the message is that you can really pick and choose among the different kinds of exercise in order to uh, enhance your health. So depending on what your goals are, uh, what your personal uh, lifestyle is like, what your health status is like, you can pick among the varieties of exercise and um, engage in them. The other part that's really key is to pick something that you're going to enjoy and I think are uh, one of my colleagues is going to talk a little bit about that uh, as well today, but uh, there's really many, many different choices uh, that you can, can make um, in, that, in that regard. So it's a menu of physical activity. Uh, the other thing that we have uh, found in our, our extensive review of the literature and the science about exercise is what you're doing right now is really bad for your health. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you, but sitting is really hazardous. Um, 
Uh, in fact, in my classes uh, here at TC, all of my students have permission to know that they can stand up at any time during class and just stand in the side, um, and that will help to break up their sedentary time. Uh, so not only is being active important, but also reducing the amount of time that you're sitting. So a uh, recommendation is to try to just stand up or move around about every 20 or 30 minutes uh, during the time when you're spending sitting, which most of us do too much of. Uh, and the last thing I, I did want to mention is the work that uh, uh, Professor Alegrante and I did with our uh, visiting scholar from Korea last year on uh, the relationships between mental health and exercise. And one thing that we found, which is not so surprising, is that being more active also reduces uh, or associated with reduced symptoms of depression and anxiety. Um, but the most surprising thing we found is exercising too much is associated with worse mental health. So, uh, you know, if you exercise more than seven and a half, maybe eight hours a week, that um, people who do that tend to have more symptoms of anxiety and depression. And we can't say they're cause and effect at this point, um, but it's definitely something that um, was surprising, but also, you know, we do know that if you exercise within this sort of optimal range, you um, are likely to have better mental health. Great. So. Um, so in the spirit of uh, Carol's recommendation, 15 seconds, just stand up quickly <laughs> before we go to the next speaker. Oh, I like that. And um, you know, if, if Carol Garber has uh, really pointed out to us the importance of physical activity uh, throughout uh, the lifetime, uh, our next speaker, Steve Silverman, is going to talk, I think, a little about his experience in schools and what it is that we can do to help children uh, establish habits early on so they can be uh, individuals who grow into adulthood and continue their physical activity. You may sit down now, please. I was just thinking as we're standing that later on today there's a cocktail reception yeah. and <laughs> you will all get to stand during that. So um, I'm, thank you for coming. I'm, I'm here because I'm a physical educator, uh, former high school teacher, and I do research on physical education in the schools. And I'm interested in how children develop skills and knowledge and attitudes um, in physical education. And uh, as, as some of you may know, that uh, f physical activity can help people in so, so many ways. And I was struck the other day in, in the Times that it had a report that, and as some of us like me are getting into perhaps an older age group, that simple aerobic or resistive exercise helps people remember better. And it doesn't take a lot uh, to do that and enhances the quality of life. And as those of us who, are, who do physical activity know that. And so my, my research has taken place with children. And uh, one of the things we want to do is help children enjoy movement so they'll want, want to do it as time goes on. So I'm going to make um, three points about that and about physical education. Uh, the first is that good physical education is needed uh, to reach these goals. There, we, in order for people to learn, it's both the quality and the quantity of physical education um, that, that's important. And many locales these days are substituting research, re, recess for physical education. As you might imagine, uh, recess often does not have a whole lot of educational value to it. And there have been studies looking that couch potatoes aren't really moving during research, uh, recess, and they're not learning to develop habits and, and, and enjoy uh, physical acti activity as they, they do the, that. Uh, conversely, there have been quite a number of studies that have been done uh, recently that have uh, looked at a quality physical education program and, whether, and physical activity in children and whether or not how that relates to test scores. Because often school administrators will say, I just don't have the time for physical education or art or music. 
And every study, including an extensive literature review by the CDC, has suggested um, good physical education's not o education programs not only uh, do not detract from test scores, they help enhance test scores. And kids that are more physically active do better in school. A and that, uh, I, I think, is, is very interesting. California did all this research where they do fitness tests among their kids, and they controlled for all the val variables you would think, like socioeconomic status and those kinds of things. And as a result, um, it still came out. Kids who were more physically active, phys more physically fit, did, did better um, in, in schools. Um, I also think we need to think more about um, physical education than just learning skill um, and, and play, playing games. For about 18 years, my doctoral students and I have been investigating attitude. And th this came um, to one of my former students when I was at the University of Illinois, and, and I, as we, we're in a social setting, talking about things. And we started to read on attitude because it became clear that learning skill wasn't enough to get children to want to do and like physical activity. Uh, lots of people have suggested and speculated, including us, that if kids develop good attitudes towards physical education and physical activity early, they're more likely to participate in physical activity. Um, and we've learned tons about activity in, in those 18 years about attitude. One of the things that we've learned is that um, moderately and low-skilled kids have uh, not as strong attitudes as high-skilled children, and that attitude seems to be tied uh, toward whether or not kids are participating in physical activity and think about it. One, one of the things that um, Eve Bernstein, who's one of my students, did on her dissertation was look at kids of different skill levels and a competition, which a lot of people had speculated, was linked to why children didn't like physical education. They started thinking about that volleyball game where they weren't prepared and the spike was coming down, down on them. So we, we, we need, need to, to think about. Um, just one, one last thought is that uh, we want to think about physical education as a well-taught um, program with a comprehensive curri curriculum. <clears throat> Excuse me. In many elementary schools these days, the um, physical education program is not taught by a trained physical educator, and as a result, the physical education is not very good in those programs. We recently did a study where he matched physical educators who were trained as physical educators or not. And a surprising difference occurred in, in the, the two different settings do, doing that. One very educationally focused, the other doing all the things that we know does not promote skill nor develop a, a, a attitude. So we need to think about creating a situation where kids are enjoying things, learning things, having fun, so they'll want, want to do that, that later. Physical activity is important in several regards. Uh, it improves physical health, of course, and that's, that's one of the reasons why we're engaged in it. But it also improves uh, mental health. And importantly for those of us at a place called Teachers College, it, it has an impact on school achievement and the ability to perform cognitive tasks that are complicated. So we, we know the benefits. Aaron, you've worked a lot with uh, individuals as a personal trainer, uh, and some of them, in, from what I see of the bio, have been quite prominent. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us that would be valuable today? I can tell you that um, they, it's competition and it's judgment, and um, they don't, they like to go at their own speed, and you have to encourage them mm -hmm. to go at their own speed. And you, you know, you can't rush these things. Tell yeah. us more. Well, I'd like to actually get up and yeah. speak, so if that's okay. While I'm speaking, the pictures from my trips are just going to um, go by. And that's just <laughs> I can't, it's just eye candy for you. It's not really <laughs> <laughs>
So I'm here to share my wisdom and pathway to wellness and how I got there from here. I graduated from Teachers College in 1988. I was pregnant with my first child, which is why I wrote my thesis on pregnancy and exercise. But that was a long time ago, and my son is now 26. So fast forward today and the business I created in the internet. Sports, travel, adventure, and therapy. STAT, as I'd like to call it. The name encompasses it all and embodies the core of what I do in creating a well-rounded, healthy, and full life physically, emotionally, and spiritually for women. Sport is activity, therapy, travel is unpredictable, adventure is exciting, and therapy is the wellness piece that brings it all together. Wellness is not linear, as we've just heard. Um, as my panelists have presented, it's a mind, body, and spirit connection. And interestingly, um, Lisa Miller just spoke about spirituality and spirituality and wellness. Very interesting. The part of my wellness I bring to the table is spirituality, which means something different to everyone. For me, it means that there is something greater than the concrete world we live in. Life is a challenge for some more than others. And we all have to deal with and overcome adversity in some form or another. My trips challenged my girls physically to hike to the top of Machu Picchu in Peru, or Pico Duarte in the Dominican, or even to Mount Ventoux in France. These physical challenges serve as a metaphor for obstacles we face in our life. We practice yoga to go inward, or else it's just gym. Mm -hmm. And it teaches us that life is repetitive and has patterns, just like the season. We know that after winter comes spring, and after spring comes summer, and then we are back to fall. So the therapy, besides massage, yoga, bonding, and a lot of laughing that I offer on a stat trip, that has the most impact is the talking stick ceremony, <coughs> which we sit in a circle together and share our thoughts and feelings. It's a powerful unifying practice whose origins stem from the very beginning of human time. All early cultures, cultures notably Native Americans, practice some form of this ritual. It's a profound and simple way of talking and listening and bonding the group together for an esoteric experience because the benefits or the lessons usually appear or are revealed in retrospect when you return to your life. So I encourage and nature, nurture women to find their voices, to be open to the universe, that what they have to say is meaningful and what they believe makes a difference. I find the stick on our first hiking day and we engage in this ritual on the second night giving everyone the first day to get comfortable with each other. So I call my stick ceremony Living with Intention. It's, it created, I created this ceremony from a vision quest that I went on about 20 years ago. So before the trip, I asked my clients to bring something to tie on the stick and to talk about what's working in their life, what's not, and what's possible. The stick is passed around the circle and the person holding the stick speaks until she has fully expressed her feelings and no one else interrupts. It's usually something you would like to change or encourage about yourself and by saying it out loud, it becomes a reality. It's healing and emotional and tears flow. So the hiking, biking, kayaking, eating, drinking, bonding, tears, and especially the laughter, each is an integral part of what makes every stat trip a mind, body, and spirit connection. A package to be truly health, happy, healthy, and well. So, What's the takeaway? How do you implement this into your life? While we understand that not everyone has the good fortune of taking a sad trip, the takeaways are for all. Every once in a while, I hit the pause, I hit the pause button in my life. You need to take time for yourself, engage in physical activity alone as well as with your friends, nurture friendships, have gratitude, and practice what you preach. Adam Grant, the youngest tenured and highest rated Wharton professor, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> says, it, says it best in his new book, Give and Take. The secret yeah. to life is giving back. And I quote, the greatest untapped source of motivation is a sense of service to others. Yeah. Focusing on the contribution of our work to other people's lives has the potential to make us more productive than thinking about helping ourselves. So I am in the service business. I give women an opportunity to come out and play, sometimes out of their comfort zone, Go to incredible sacred places around the world, bond with amazing women, create everlasting friendships and memories, but also to exercise and challenge ourselves emotionally, physically, 
and spiritually, all the while encouraging them to be themselves, but more important, encouraging them to be the best self they can be. Um, I'm here to talk about worksite wellness, and as a graduate uh, here from TC, I studied um, applied physiology and nutrition, where then we focused a lot on working with individuals and small groups. And now I think about it as my good fortune to be able to work with organizations from 100 upwards of 7,000. So as a registered dietitian and certified personal trainer, to be able to develop programs that can appeal to such large audiences, to me, is a big treat. It's a lot different than you know, working one-on-one, -on -one, but really, when we get together as a group of professionals from my practice, we think of each individual from that organization and try to figure out, as you know, the, the presenter of the introduction was, to inspire each of these individuals to adopt wellness. So we try to lead them to different areas of wellness to help them understand areas that they need to focus on and then help them appreciate how to get there. So I feel like, you know, in today's sort of the next five minutes, just I'd love to give you a quick introduction to why worksite wellness is important, what are some of the does it work, and yes, I believe that there's a lot of research that is because I know you're all focused mostly on research, as, are, as am I, and, you know, we use research and evidence-based practice and principles to drive our programs and our, our whole organization. And then quickly tell you some of the, the best practices. So all in six minutes, I promise John. So actually, so the, the first slide there, um, basically we have a very captive audience, right? If everybody's at work for a minimum of eight hours, um, and your employer is giving you health care and health insurance, it becomes a really important place where wellness has to happen. I don't believe that any organizations ever wanted to be in the healthcare business, but with health care costs rising at double digits, I think they've had to jump in and figure out how do we manage our health care costs that are rising uh, so quickly. Uh, we can see some, from some of the statistics that the numbers are booming, you know, smaller companies, larger companies, everybody is getting involved in worksite wellness. All different areas of practice. Uh, it's not even like it's just finance firms or manufacturing firms, which was, you know, started earlier, but it's really, we find that everybody's getting into the game. Within the last week even, I don't know if you caught the Wall Street Journal article, the New Times article, and NPR story on worksite wellness. Just this past week, last seven days, literally. So it has become really an important phenomenon. Um, we can look at some of the benefits of worksite wellness, and there are many. So whether we're talking about reduced health care costs, improved employee retention, better morale, decreased absenteeism, and again, moderating or lower health care costs, there's a lot of research showing a myriad of benefits um, with regards to providing worksite wellness. And again, I don't have that much time, but you know, some of the things with wellness we include, whether it's physical activity, either teaching people about exercise or actually having them engage in exercise. It could be weight management, smoking cessation, stress management, and again, I could talk on each of these one topic for a long, long time. Um, but really looking at the overall person, uh, looking and deciding what's appropriate for that organization is really key. But there are benefits, and indeed, there's a lot of research showing a return on investment. I hear this often when people say, you know, we really can't prove that worksite wellness happens, or, or we can't prove that we, we see you know, improvements in uh, healthcare costs, but that's not necessarily the case. I've listed a couple of studies here, you can kind of see the numbers, and if anybody wants copies of the presentation, feel free to drop me your email later, or grab my card. Um, but there's a lot of research. There's a uh, another Harvard Business Review article, another article um, from uh, several researchers over at Harvard talking about these meta-analyses of the benefits of worksite wellness and the return on investment. So on average, and you can kind of see different numbers here, upwards of $6 for every dollar spent, and in the other two studies it was closer to $3 to $3.50 for every dollar spent, so there's a $3.50 cost savings. So there's a definite benefit. From my experience, why some you know, organizations uh, disagree that there might be a benefit is because many work sites don't appreciate how to go about doing work site wellness. Right? And so they think, well, I have yoga and Weight Watchers. Why are they getting a return on my money? Well, you know, yoga is important, and Weight Watchers can be a big benefit. But I think putting together the strategy and a big sort of comprehensive plan really matters. 
So these are I mean, what I believe to be the elements of a successful program which can really help to benefit the employees and the employer and really, again, help to help you derive some of these benefits. So senior level support, many of our programs, you know, I'm proud and happy to say that we see you know, senior management, we see CEOs coming in, getting screened, participating in a team-based wellness challenge. And that matters because then middle managers see what's going on and then they allow their employees to do it too. And it really is that trickle down and that camaraderie really helps in a lot of different ways. Background data, we never just go in and run a wellness program. You have to look at what are the healthcare costs? What are the issues that are plaguing this organization? And you know, we can, as health professionals, get probably obesity, lack of physical activity, et cetera, stress. But it's important to know what are the issues, do some strategy and assessment, develop an operating plan to plan an evaluation, just like you would a research study. And I did have somebody say to me the other day, so what are we doing, a research study here? You want to do screenings pre and post? It sounds crazy. And I thought, we need to document outcomes. And they're looking at me, guy, 15 heads. But this is how you can then say to senior management, we've made a real uh, dent in you know, what we're trying to accomplish. So often, if you develop a wellness where you get individuals from the different departments and the different areas of business to really feel engaged in the program, <laughs> they are then your champions. They are then the people that go out and help to promote the program. So we get engagements of 60, 70, 80, 90% participation in many of our overall programs, not even just in a, a you know, four-week walking challenge. You need to change the culture and the environment. Right? If you're talking about nutrition and then employees can't get healthy food in the cafeteria or if the cookie is 25 cents and it's this big, you know, 50 cents, and then the <laughs> apple is, you know, four dollars and it looks awful, yes, that really needs to change. We can't have that kind of a culture. And as I mentioned, there has to be some sort of evaluation. Because if you're not evaluating and documenting, as I said, that you've made headway and you're moving people from high risk to either moderate risk or low risk, and you can't ever say that you've really done a great job. You know, simply just saying, oh, we had 15 people come to this program, we had 22 people come to this, and six people come to that. That's great, we're looking at participation, but we really need to look at the big picture and evaluate to make sure that you're making sort of the headway that you're looking to accomplishing your goals. I'm gonna start with the first question and just exercise the prerogative of the moderator. <laughs> Um, we've heard a lot about personal individual responsibility in, in my uh, estimation here. We've been talking a lot about individuals undertaking um, efforts to be more physically active. And I'm just wondering, and I'm probably going to direct this to my uh, two faculty colleagues, at least initially, and, and certainly Aaron and Deborah can, can join in, but I'd like to know what's the next generation of work that has to be done because I think, uh, much like we've learned over the last 40 years uh, about smoking, everyone knows it's not good for you. And uh, similarly, everyone knows that physical activity is good for you. But what kinds of societal changes, um, what's the next generation of work that we have to do to, uh, in effect, facilitate and support uh, people to be more physically active in, in our society? I guess I'll, I'll start. Um, well, John, if I actually knew that, I'd be winning the Nobel Prize, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> well, you are the president of ACM. Now. <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, you know, I think one of the things is really to work within our various spheres of influence, so whether it's the work site or the school or, you know, working with our public officials. I mean, so much of our lives are, are set up, so we really don't have the time to move around and there's really a culture against moving around there's a lot of culture against eating healthy foods and making healthy choices and um, you know we have to really work with our public officials um, we need to uh, you know help kids particularly because that's a, a, our nearly our next generation learn that it's actually fun and cool to be active and eat broccoli and, and things like that so you know I think all of us can can help just by within our own sphere of, of you know setting example and making role models for kids and and others but uh, and, uh, and alternately we can all get a pet to walk around. So. <laughs> I, I, I agree with Carol that we need to start young and that we 
we want to think about helping children develop tho those attitudes early. It seems to me that if children develop a, a like, they think physical activity is fun, and that'll be different for different children, but it's probably not team sports for most, most of them, particularly when they become adults. And, and I, I love team sports, but somewhere in my late 30s, I was at the University of Illinois playing basketball with like 25 year olds and decided being sore for two days afterwards well, was not, not. <laughs> not a good physical activity um, to, to do. So I think we need to start young. We need to think about how, how we're um, e educating children. Um, I, I think that one, one of the things is that kids need to think that physical activity, that there are a range of activities that they can enjoy. And I often think in a city like this, that is so very walkable, mm -hmm. that you know, forming walking clubs in schools and do, doing things l like that. Uh, my, my brother was a high school principal at one time in Philadelphia, and he used to, for kids who did certain things, he would go for runs with them. <laughs> and when he first came, the teachers said really bad things about him for that. And the last year he was principal at that high school, like 80 ch kids and he ran on the Broad Street Run, which is a four mile run along Broad Street in Philadelphia. And I think that having children think about physical activity is something they want to do that, that and, and doing in a fun way. And those of us who are older have to model that to the children also. Absolutely. Uh, Deborah. Yeah, one thing I'd mention as we're all sort of health professionals is to, and I think it's important within our own sphere of influence to talk, I always get this backwards, talk the talk and walk the walk. And so I think many of us, you know, I think, well, especially on the panel, we're all doing our exercises regularly, and I have my vouch right here, my, someone who vouched for me, always addicted to the elliptical, is that my nickname? <laughs> and doing strength training. But I think that, you know, again, um, it goes beyond doing the regular physical activity program. It's now we're realizing the benefits of regular sleep patterns, and um, we know nutrition matters, and managing stress, and work-life balance. So I feel like within our own spheres of influence, both professionally and personally, I think that that's that's what we need to do to be able to promote sort of what we need to sort of see happen in our own communities and beyond. Yeah. And you have to make it fun. You have to enjoy what you're doing. Don't pick an exercise that you are dreading. You have to pick an exercise that you actually enjoy. If you don't love running, don't run. Fast walk, Go, you know, ride a bicycle. Don't force yourself. Don't put yourself through the torture. You have to like it, or else it's not fun. Well, and, and I, if I could just expand yeah. on that. One, one, one of the things about not liking it is that people who start too fast, too hard, too mm -hmm. soon, right. end up not liking it. And I, I uh, had a colleague at the University of Illinois that has done a lot of research on um, exercise psychology and efficacy. <laughs> and it typically takes 16 to 20 weeks for someone to enjoy physical activity and doing it. And so my feeling is if people are going to start running and they haven't run in a while, maybe they should start walking mm -hmm. and walk two more blocks tomorrow and two more till they get to the distance then run a block every so often that if people are doing it for life, if it takes 10 more weeks to get get there, it really doesn't matter. So uh, let's open it up to the floor uh, for questions. And uh, Sue, uh, well, let's start with you. I bet you do. You're going to ask John what he does for exercise? <laughs> I, 
I, I think that's well Being above silent. all of our pay grades except for John. <laughs> well, I, I, I will say I'm a, I serve on a All Columbia Wellness Committee, um, so across all the campuses here at Columbia, and we have been, you know, chipping away at ideas of how to help people. So there are, in fact, walking clubs and some other activities. We're certainly not where we should go. And, you know, I periodically send uh, research that shows cost savings in healthcare to our uh, vice president for finance. Um, so, um, you know, I, I'm torturing some people up there periodically, but we could definitely do a lot more. I, I think Carol's also been one of the people, pr probably along with Steve, who's lobbied to open the gymnasium back up at, at Teachers College, uh, which you know we, we, we closed some years back to build out, build out some office space. But I, I think we are making some progress. Um, I've noticed that the stairwells in some parts of the college have begun to look more attractive. <laughs> and this is in fact what I was getting at a moment ago about uh, environmental changes and environmental supports to facilitate our simply being more ambulatory. You know, we live in a society where we drive from our living room into our bedroom. We live in a society <laughs> where we don't have mixed land use, if you will, that, right. that facilitates people, you know, being able to be more active in terms of the work, play, uh, worship in their communities. And um, I think Steve was even pointing out that there are differences in body mass in cities like New York compared to Houston or Atlanta where people are in their automobiles more. So I was, I was pushing our panel uh, on the notion of, of the kinds of policy and structural societal changes that would in fact encourage and support people to be more active because I think much of our, our, our work in this area, whether it be workplace health promotion or, or um, general community health promotion efforts. It's largely about teaching people compensatory skills to respond to an environment that may not be necessarily uh, the most supportive. But, but we are in a laboratory. I think you're right. Um, I think there's more that we can be doing. But I think at least we are finally, uh, and I've been here for 30 years, we are making connections between health and education unlike we've ever made before at Teachers College. I think that has a lot to do with the leadership recognizing that this is a unique institution where we can be talking about those connections. I actually think it depends on the kids and, and the reception and how that's taught, d doing it. Uh, and, and I am not um, too young to remember that and to not remember that. And, and, and taught in a high school where we taught rope climbing and stuff. But one, one of the things I think, if, if things are in a curriculum like that and where people challenge themselves. And there are lots of models in physical education of people doing challenging activ activities, uh, adventure kinds of activities. Uh, often more res uh, resource schools have um, elements built in where kids are doing things high and low and um, that, that are more adventure. I, I think rope climbing, if we're going to do those things again, kids need to learn how to do it, yeah. and they need to develop the skills and the strength to do it. One of the things I think that's sad is that when teachers don't teach that, or, or kids who don't have the upper body strength, and even though it's largely lower body strength that's do doing that, and you know, 30 kids are watching them not be successful, probably not going to contribute to them feeling good about themselves. Yeah. I don't know if everybody can hear. It's uh, whether work sites are employing or utilizing the services of occupational health therapists. Uh, so from my experience, some of those companies that work sort of more in the manufacturing areas will have, whether it's nurses, occupational therapists, physical therapists, more likely to have them on staff. So the answer is yes in sort of when they have those kind of safety uh, programs already in place. Most, I'll have to say from my experience, don't. You know, most aren't employing um, OTs, PTs, nurses. They're utilizing them on a part-time basis. The, the question was, are there meaningful differences in how um, girls and boys respond yeah, to competition? Well, I, actually, um, in, in our research, gender is not as big a deal as skill level is in looking at competition. High-skilled girls and boys look a lot alike in how they 
approach it and low skilled boys and girls feel feel the same way and, and I think um, that there are ways ways of approaching competition where kids are developing skill but where people are put into a large full court game without the skill um, that why would you think that people who don't have the skill are going to enjoy that whether they're boys or girls the, the problem is we've, you know, we've really often delivered the message about being more active um, in a way that is really off-putting to a lot of people and also very technical, so people have a lot of difficulty in following them. Um, you know, we still have the very specifics because when you work with a fitness or health professional who's going to give you recommendations, they need to know that information in order to give you some um, guidance and, and what the uh, optimal way to approach the activity. Um, you know, exercise, the way we use it, is really more intentional physical activity. So it's any kind of moving about that you're doing for the purpose of improving your health or physical fitness. So, it, you know, it isn't, and I know for many people it brings up this connotation of the gym and you know going up the ropes or running, uh, but it really you know what we're really talking about is a wide array of activities. So whether it's salsa dancing or you know just moving around um, in your home, um, you know anything, walking around a museum or a mall, you know all can really be part of a exercise program. Um, and we've really de-emphasized the idea that you really have to pay attention to your heart rate and. Um, that it's really more what's a comfortable pace and that you really should be listening to your body and that's really the more important thing. For those who really want to get more technical, then, you know, that's great because certain people really like to keep track of their heart rate and their, you know, step counts and all of those things. But, you know, what the recommendations are is, you know, use what you need, what's helpful to you and that is acceptable to you. They, they are on there. Actually, you can get them at the www.acsm.org, um, or you can email me, and I'd be happy to, to send them along. I mean, the guidelines are sort of oriented towards professionals, but I think there is a lot of um, information that's very helpful to everyone. Well, you know, our, our guidelines really were targeted to professionals. But yes, you know, the answer is yes. I mean, the Centers for Disease Control and others have been working on it. Um, we're actually doing some work with that in our, our uh, lab. One of our doctoral students is actually uh, working on developing a reality television show. <laughs> um, well, sort of like if reality and game show, it's really kind of a mix. Um, but the goal is really to embed the message about physical activity without really talking about exercise and, you know, hey, you should really be more active. Mm -hmm. Even at the gym, you go to the gym and it says, please talk to your doctor before you step on this dangerous machine. I mean, the reality is exercise is not very dangerous, but you're right, we tend to really uh, overprotect ourselves, and it does give people a message that's really incorrect. I think the, the one area of the what we call the comprehensive coordinated school health program that for the last 25, 30 years we've been trying to promote uh, throughout the nation. The one area where I think we've made the most progress, interestingly enough, has been in changing the menu uh, in most schools in America. Um, but you're absolutely right. There are still areas where uh, there's an inconsistency between what is being taught uh, and learned in the classroom about good nutrition and what may be offered in the school cafeteria. But I, I think we've made really tremendous inroads on that, um, and I think in the work site as well. I'll comment. Um, also, I mean, I'm up in Massachusetts right now, and I served on our town, uh, it was the Wellness Council, the nutrition sort of focus group as an RD. Uh, and so there, the rules, you know, guidelines that we had to implement last year are, are much more stringent and I think a much better place. So I think that kids are getting better options. Whether or not they're liking and eating it is still to be debated <laughs> amongst parents and teachers, et cetera, because um, it's all in the presentation and what they're used to and what they're used to getting at schools. But I think there has been some, some positive changes happening from my perspectives. But you're right, and we tackle that in the workplace as well. Mm -hmm. So we really do try to work alongside the cafeteria to help them 
pass out healthy foods, make healthier, you know, hop options, whether it's subsidized or just available to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. It is a challenge. Thank you. Well, regrettably, perhaps, uh, we've come to the end of uh, the session. I want to do two things before you all leave. I, I want you to join me in thanking our panel today for the conversation.